So at the end of the last conference, I did a closing session uh, where I recapped insights from 86 briefings I had done with, with leadership teams, for, uh, tech companies in 2020. And, you know, just you know, talking about each of these leadership teams or talking about the impact of the, the current environment, how they're going to come out of it. And one question I asked in all of those briefings was, you know, did people feel that they were going to come out stronger? after this pandemic, better positioned to drive uh, and capture market share. So we call this C to A, really crisis to advantage. And literally 90% of leadership teams said, oh, we're definitely come out of this stronger. Uh, I would use that same question in, in, in webinar polls last year. 90% of the audience would say, hey, you know, we're going to come out stronger. But the reality is, you know, not all companies use this downtime as effectively as others. And as we do come out of this downturn, as the economy starts to come back, we are seeing this, this bifurcation in performance and this separation, what we call you know, uncomfortably, the have and have nots of the technology uh, industry. And so let me put a, a simple definition on the table in terms of who's a have and who's a have not. Um, haves are, are tech companies that are growing at least 10% revenues, uh, you know, year over year, and they're 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 getting some love from investors, right? Their market cap is at least four times greater than their annual revenues. Have not are technology companies that are 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 struggling to grow top lines, and they're they're not getting a lot of love from the investors. Their their market cap may equal their annual revenues. So I want to warm the audience up here and, and start with this question here, this first poll. You know, your company right now, how would they be classified based on that definition I just put on the table? Would your company be a have or, or a have not? And uh, as I always encourage people to put your coffee down or, or put your lunch down, depending on what time zone you're on, take a moment, let's come on in, let's, let's see where the results come in. And let's and the votes are coming in. Slowly but surely. Good. I think uh, Maria, people understand how to, the polling must be uh, pretty simple to get to because we see uh, good response rates here. And I also think you cast a, a spell over the audience, Thomas, because the numbers are coming in almost dead on what you yeah. said. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're, it's, this is going to be uh, interesting how this conversation unfolds because you you know the data like I know the data. Um, so we'll give people. Wow, they're still coming in pretty strong. I hate to cut. I hate to cut the numbers off. This is great. Love to see the uh, the quick responses here. And hey, and thanks everybody for for participating. I know like a lot of us, you know, we're we're we've been doing a year plus of virtual virtual events, but we are really committed over the next three days to make sure that you you do as Maria said, this is as interactive as possible, and you, you really do get a lot out of it, and you feel that you do have a chance to interact with your with your peers. Um, well, the numbers are still coming in strong, but I'm going to cut cut it off because the ratio is not changing that much. So it, it is basically about an 80-20 rule. About 80% of you are saying, hey, I'm going to have company. We're, we're, we're really growing. We're doing great. 20% say, hey, we're not there based on that criteria. Well, let's put some data on, on the table on this. So we have an index, which many of you are very familiar with. It's called the TNS 50. 50 of the largest technology solution providers on the planet. It's the IBMs, it's the Cisco's, it's the Oracle's, it's the Microsoft. It's not born in the cloud companies. We have a separate index where we're called the TSIA Cloud 40, where we keep the, the, the cloud companies and we track them. So this is more of what we'll call the legacy incumbent technology providers uh, in the industry, but you know, all names that you would you would know. So so we just took our Q1 snapshot. So 50 of the largest technology providers on the planet, how many of them are haves based on the criteria that I, I, def, I defined here? It, only eight, only eight. So there can, there's this disparity that we see in the data, right? Companies f feel that they're gonna come, you know, crisis to advantage. Companies feel that they're really well positioned. But when you look at the data in tech, you are seeing this greater and greater bifurcation. And in that Q1 snapshot, if we look at the peer group of just hardware companies, we have one hard comp hardware company that was growing 22% top line revenue right there at half. We have another hardware company that's shrinking 22% over the same time period, right? So you, you can just see this growing 
bifurcation. And the question that you want to be asking yourself, right, if, if you're in this industry, is what's creating this separation? And this is content that we've been focused on this entire fiscal year since January. We put a paper out on this, the have and the have nots, where, where we start to put on the table what are the attributes that are really creating this separation. And so that's what we're going to go through here uh, today. And, and the first one that I'm going to put on the table is low friction land. So, um, and, and to set that up, you, you know, JB and I spend a lot of our time scanning, you know, what's going on in, in the tech industry, what trends are unfolding, what's going on in other industries that may eventually sh you know, show up in tech. And, and often when we see something that piques our interest, we'll just text each other or email each other and say, hey, did you see this? So a couple weeks ago, I get a text, JB, from you about this car commercial you saw in the Bay Area where literally you buy the car, you show up, you don't even talk to anybody, right? It was a local, it was a local uh, dealership, I believe, right, that had that. And, and it's, it's a flavor of this Carvana, right, where you're not dealing with a salesperson, you're not dealing with, you know, all these long, you know, checkouts, et cetera. And your text to me was, this is coming to tech, right? This is coming to tech. And, yep. um, and it, it is, right? So if you look at a company like, like AWS, you know, you can buy pretty much all of their services in, in three clicks. I was on their website last week, took me three clicks to the point where I could go ahead and buy a service. And JB, when you and I talk about this, you know, we talk about the resistance with with a lot of companies saying, look, I'm, I, you know, our stuff's too complex. We don't think this is coming our way. And enterprise solutions are more complex, right? Some are more complex than others. But if you would ask, you know, in any of us seven years ago, do you think it could buy storage, compute powers, analytic services, security services by three clicks on a website? I think most of us would have said, you know, no way, too complex. Yet there it is. So another quick poll here. I'm very curious, you know, on your website right now, how many clicks would it take before I could buy a service, right? Is it, is it three or less? Is it four or more, or you have no idea? Let's see where this comes in. Now the data is shaping a little bit differently here, JP. Yep. <laughs> now it's a little bit different. And, and by the way, this is this paradox, right? It, people feel very confident, but when you click into what's going on, you start to see this gap um, between where things are, are going and what people, you know, how they're actually positioned. But again, great response rates here and the data is flying in and it's shaping up to be about, you know, a 60-40 a, um, a, a rule in the sense that about 60% of you really have no idea. And, and that's not surprising because again, in, especially in, in, in B2B, this is not how we think about going to market. This is not how we think about, you know, a, a channel. So, so how optimized is our website for somebody to buy something directly? We don't think about that. Uh, we, we need to stop thinking about that. Uh, about four percent of you are coming in and saying it's 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 three or less. So this is a clear minority practice, right? But but this is going to change. And, and and most of you are very familiar with the TSI layer model: um, land, adopt, expand, renew. And you know historically, we spent a lot of our time and our energy and our resources on land because it was complex. We had to get the customer to spend a lot of money up front, convince convince them that it's you know that they should take that risk. But as we move to more of these as a service models, as we as we move um, you know to, to to models that really we lower the friction and make it easier for the customer to get on the platform and we really focused economics are around adopt and expand, right? That's where the game is, is being played. And so we wanna make it easier for the customer to get started. And I'll give you a, a complex enterprise example here. Um, so most of you are familiar with Palantar, they're in the news quite a bit, but go out and read their 10K. Go out and read their financial documents. They're very, very explicit that they have this low friction land strategy. They basically land customers um, and at, at cost or, or, or no money changes hand, right? They expect to lose money in this first phase where they're acquiring the customer, they're installing a solution, they're demonstrating value. Once they demonstrate value, they expect to expand and scale that customer and that's where they'll make money. So it is a complete low friction land mentality and, and and look at the valuation on this company 
right? I mean, it is just absolutely insane. The last time I took a snapshot, over $30 billion market cap under on less than a billion dollars of, of revenue, right? So low friction land, is that something that you have? The next one is around <clears throat> as a service revenues. And what we saw during the downturn is more and more revenue started to flow to as a service offers as opposed to traditional offers. And there's a lot of reason, right? Customers want the flexibility of spending up and down. Um, they want to, you know, break down their data centers, get more things out into the cloud, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the companies that I just mentioned that are the has, many of these have pivoted to more as a service revenues like Microsoft, like Adobe, like Autodesk, right? So this is clearly where the revenue is flowing. But what's really interesting, what's happened over the past year, year and a half year, is that this global pandemic really accelerated some vertical industries into as a service. So a great example is financial services, right? This is an area where a lot of the, these, these companies wanted to run their own infrastructure, not very interested in as a service. Now you look at, at a company like NCR saying, look, <laughs> you know, it's all about as a service for us, right? That, you know, we're, we're doing managed services. We're, we're, we're gonna run ATMs for our banks because the banks are asking for that, right? So there's a, there's a vertical industry that was cautious before, now leaning into as a service. We see the same thing in healthcare. This is, we have many healthcare technology companies that are in the membership. And, and for years, they've been telling us, look, that is not the way that healthcare, the hospitals want to buy, that healthcare providers want to buy. They're CapEx oriented. Again, they're very cautious. They're not into this subscription. They're not into this cloud thing. And then you see companies like ResMed coming out with cloud-based, subscription-based you know, offers, just crushing it right? Just taking market share, growing revenues. So, so there is no doubt that companies have more as a service revenues are going to be doing better. And, and when we go back to this TNS 50 web uh, index here, look at companies on the right hand side. This means they have more and more revenue coming from services. They are going to be better positioned for growth if that service revenue is not coming from legacy maintenance, which sometimes, you know, that's that's where it's coming from. No, it's coming from managed offers, SaaS offers, right? True as a service offers. That is a critical attribute. Okay, that's the second one. Third one is signal liquidity. And this is not uh, our term. This is a term that comes from Scott uh, Galloway, who's a professor at NYU. He does a great pod, uh, podcast with Kara Swisher uh, uh, called Pivot. And um, he always talks about companies that have strong signal liquidity are much better positioned in their markets. And he uses the consumer example of Netflix. And, and Netflix is way better positioned than a cable provider in terms of understanding what the customer cares about and they can better serve that. And he says, look, you're, you know, you're, you're more likely as a middle-aged you know, adult to get divorced than cancel your Netflix <laughs> subscription, right? And so that is an important concept as we as we move forward. Companies that have good, strong signal liquidity, it sets up other beautiful things. What are those things? Well, the first one is analytic-driven insights. And this is something that we've been on for a couple years, many years now. Um, but again, it's really coming to fruition. So you get customers into as a service offers. E even if they're on-prem, you're bolting on cloud capabilities, you're getting better telemetry. What are you doing with that? You're, you're running analytics around that and playing back to your customer, right? Helpful insights to help them optimize their, their processes. And it's interesting that, you know, we still talk to, to a lot of companies who say, look, I just don't have good telemetry. I don't really have, you know, anything, you know, to help the customer to with. It, it just is what it is, right? That, that answer is, is not okay. And there's a paper that we did called Your Mess for More. You should look at that if, you, if you're stuck with a lot of on-prem product that's not connected and, and what's the journey you can get on. But, you know, I'm going to make this assertion here that, that you know, even the simplest technologies, there's an opportunity here in terms of analytic driven insights. And an example I like to use is, is Michelin, right? The tire company. So, so I can't think of a more basic technology than a freaking rubber tire. <laughs> but if you get sensors 
if you get good signal liquidity, you can change the value proposition, which is what Michelin does with this particular offer. It's now fleet management. They are now helping their customers optimize uptime of vehicles and total cost by making sure the freaking tires are properly inflated and vehicles are running, et cetera. So this is a critical attribute. If you're sitting here and you said in the earlier poll, we're definitely a have, and, and you don't have good signal liquidity that you can use you know, for these types of analytics, that's a problem. I question, you know, that that you're really positioned to be a have. And then the other thing that these analytics set up is this con this concept of adoption that aptitude. So what is that? Let me use an example here. There's a company called Snowflake um, that has, you know, services, compute and storage services, which are, you know, there's a lot of people out there offering that. So, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty competitive space. Um, but, but they continually get ranked as a company that is very, very good at driving the adoption of their particular application, right? They have a good aptitude here. They know how to get customers to, to not just download their apps, but to actually help them to start to use them. And just like we saw with Palantir, I mean, this attribute really generates, you know, investor love. I mean, geez, oh man, I mean, uh, in market cap last time, they took the snapshot of over 70 billion with revenues less than, than 300 million, right? That's just incredibly, you know, insane. And this particular attribute, we are going to double click in to in a fireside chat tomorrow with Kim uh, Peretti from um, DocuSign. And, and it's a, you know, it's, this is all we're going to talk about is, is what does good adoption aptitude look like? What are some of the key attributes there, et cetera? Um, so we're going to spend time on that. Join us for, for that keynote. So after adoption aptitude, what's next? Product led growth. And I just I have to make uh, an observation here. We're, we're, we're going to be starting a podcast series right after this, um, a ten part podcast series on the have and have nots. And so each episode is going to be on one of these uh, these attributes. And I was just doing some some writing and, and scripting for the episode on product led growth. So I was out yesterday, you know, googling this topic and just looking for the most recent articles I could find. And I found one that was published April twenty eighth. And it was titled "Product Led Growth," and uh, you know, of this month or last month. So I was reading it, and the author was basically asserting that product led growth. There's nothing new under the sun here. That there are tons of companies that have been doing product led growth forever. And then the author cited companies like Wang and DEC and Sun Microsystems, etc. And his assertion was. You know, it's been forever. The companies have great products and they use their great products <laughs> to drive growth. Uh, that is not product led growth. They, they, you know, that's, the, that's not a product led strategy, right? We have a great product and that's why we win market share. Product led growth, right? If, if, if you're not as close to this, is a, is a different concept. It's the concept that you are using the product itself to be a critical vehicle to grow the customer, right? For the customer to do the initial trial, for the customer to convert to a paying customer, for the customer to click and buy more, for the customer to click and renew. That's the concept of, of product-led growth. And, and why is it so important? Well, there's an index, it's not a TSI index, it's a, a, another group has it out there, it's called the, their PLG index. And they're just tracking companies that have product-led growth capabilities, companies like DocuSign, companies like Zoom, right? Companies where you can use the product to, to, to buy things. And the growth rate of these companies is, is pushing 30%. So again, as we talk about have and have nots, we have traditional tech companies in the TS50 and Q1 on average only growing about 4%. And again, when you look under that, this growing bifurcation, some of them growing very well, some of them shrinking. You look at born in the cloud companies on average in the TSIA cloud 40 growing at about 17%. And now these product led growth companies growing at 30%. So you can, you can see how you know, important this attribute comes becomes to, to growing you know, at faster rates. And then the, the, the last attribute here around the, the platform play. And so what do we mean by that? There are more and more companies that are thinking about how do I use a technology platform 
to create a platform business model. And Laura Fay, who does research for us in the area of as a service product management, has done survey work here and 73 percent of the software companies she's talking to are thinking in terms of how do I build a technology, you know, not a software product, but a technology platform that I then can build, you know, a business model uh, around. And the whole concept here, I mean, it's, this is basically the Apple App Store, but coming to a, you know, a B2B market near to you, where you are in a position to say, I've got a platform and I can bring in other solution providers that add value on top of my platform and connect them to, to, to my customers, right? And, and, and take a percentage of that, you know, that value that we're creating here. So companies that, that have that play are, are growing faster. So, so I'm just curious on that one. Is your company actively researching platform business model opportunities? Is that something that, that is percolating um, within within your company. Let's see, let's see where people are on this one. Ooh, strong market signal here as well. But let's get some more data. Come on, let's get let's get let's get people clicking. There we go. Yeah, this is the one that I would say um, really came on strong. It, that I heard more toward the tail end of last year, more more energy and more buzz on this, and I think it's carried forward um, in, in to this year and more of the the member conversations I'm in. You know, people are definitely looking at their particular markets and saying, "Gosh, how could I corner you know that opportunity?" So as data comes pouring in, we're starting to stabilize. It's about a 70 uh, 30 rule, so about 70 percent of you saying yes. We are absolutely. Uh, looking at this. So again, it, you know, that's that's good <laughs> that you're looking at it. The ones that figure it out earlier are going to be in a better position. So so let's look at all of these uh, attributes here together, right? And again, it's it's sort of a it's a it's a flywheel, if you will, right? It's a virtual cycle. You get the customer, make it easier to get the customer on the platform. And again, you might say, Thomas, our our, our solution is very complex. You know, there is no low friction land. You know, play for us. Well, then find a lower friction <laughs> land, right? How do you just make, take some of the complexity out and make it a little bit easier? Get them onto what? Get them onto as a service platforms, or if they're still on prem, bolt in cloud capabilities. Why? Because you need the signal liquidity. That's going to drive these analytics that are going to raise the value proposition. It's going to drive your ability to really work with the customer and help them adopt. You're thinking about product-led growth that you don't always have to involve a salesperson. And then as 70% plus of you are thinking, you're thinking about how do we really have a platform business model play? So let me do one more poll here. Uh, let's just look at these attributes in general. What attributes do you feel your company has in play? And I love these, you know, let's get a really good end here because uh, we always like to publish the, these results afterwards and, and comment on them. So, so click the ones um, that you, because you can click more than one. So, so where do you have your strengths? Um, and let's see, this is going to be a great one. Data is coming in. A lot of analytics driven insights. Wow, that's important. I think the answer is the results would change if, if you said added the word everywhere. Well, <laughs> as, as opposed to we have one offer over here in this that, corner yeah. of the market that does yeah. a little bit of this or a little bit of that, right? That's, that's fair. That's fair. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think, but if they've got something going on in that, it's a start. that new offer, it's a start. It's absolutely a start. So, yeah, this is going to be. Uh, and I really want this data to come in, and, I, and, and so the, we're, we're not quite where, where the maxes are. So let, let's let it keep flowing in. But analytics-driven insights is very strong right now. A little over half of you uh, have that. I can tell you, as I've talked to a lot of you know more legacy companies, this frustration. You know, if we're talking to service teams, there's the frustration. You know, we can't get the product teams to really prioritize this. Look, product teams, you know, you you have got to get on this, right? If you think this is a, a nice to have, you are mistaken. Again, this is what's creating bifurcation. Um, so you you know, this section is called the haves and have-nots. Yeah. So if you look at these results, yeah, half half of the companies, with the exception of analytics-driven insights, which, you know, if right. you don't have those, that's a, a problem. Right. But otherwise, n none of these other attributes are, majority uh, are more than, yeah, more than in the 40% yeah. rate, yeah. right? Yeah. So we have got 
you know, in the best case, because I would argue a lot of these answers are probably, you know, a part of our portfolio does this and a different part does that. Right. Uh, but at right. best, we are yeah. we are not majority practice on any of these. Yeah. yeah and, and and I think, JB, it's, it's this continued paradox, right, that we saw last year when we asked companies, you know, are you doing the right things to really set yourself up for success? And the majority of people say, oh, yeah, absolutely. But when you click into it, not so much. Here, I think companies feel um, we're really, you know, we're going to be one of these halves. But when you click into it, you know, not so much. You know, you, you got to close these gaps down because these attributes are real. <laughs> this is based on what we're saying. These are the winning attributes, right? So if, if, if you're really flat on the majority of these attributes, you know, that is, I submit to you a problem right now, and it is a growing problem. So, so let me, let's bring back the lens, JB, because, you know, as you've looked, you know, I've talked about these attributes quite a bit. Um, you know, this is part of, of a really a, a larger theme that you see here around digital business shift. So, so why don't you talk about that? Well, you know, we've, we have, because of our unique vantage point with, you know, being under NDA with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies and studying their businesses systematically and having all this data, you know, and, and the experts at TSIA, we've been able to call a lot of trends very early, right? We were, one of the first companies to stand up and say, hey, this as a service model is a thing, right? We were one of the first to say, hey, we've got an adoption problem. If we don't solve that adoption problem, we were one of the first that says that, that said you had to pivot to business outcomes, right? You better start talking about, about industries and outcomes and, and you better get good at land, adopt, expand, renew, right? So all of these trends by looking at the data and talking to, you know, you know, for lack of a better term, the haves and the have nots over the course of the last 20 years, we've been able to call a lot of these things very early. And and to your point, you know, when 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 we stood up and said, hey, we got a big adoption problem in the industry, you know, 17 years ago, most companies said, ah, not a problem. Right. We get paid up front. You know, we lock companies on to maintenance and they renew. And we said, hey, no, we actually think, you know, adoption is going to be a big thing. Right. It's going to be how customers pay. They pay for what they consume. So when we look at what's going on now, uh, you know, I, I would say and, and often, by the way, these trends are accelerated by extraordinary events. Right. The, the recession, the you know, whatever it, it, in 2008. So now we have, you know, this whole sort of pandemic and. And we're coming out of this, as you said. And I think when you stand back, you see an industry, you know, B two B technology, and, and not just in IT, but as you mentioned, in in manufacturing and industrial and healthcare, medical devices. And we are in the middle, in the probably the sort of early third of a huge fundamental shift in what successful. B2B business models look like. I mean, let's face it, most of these, you know, large companies who are the, you know, the, the big, uh, you know, 800 pound gorillas in their markets today, they grew up in a world where their stock was rewarded for basically, for lack of a better term, their ability to create all of this complexity, right? They, they had complex solutions. They had huge product lines. Um, they were get, getting paid a lot of money by customers up front to get access to this amazing technology. They had high margins. Um, you know, most of the of the customer experience was a person to person experience. I talked to a salesperson. I had the professional services people on site. I called in to talk to somebody, you know, for maintenance. Um, and 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 again, it was the right thing to do. I mean, this is what built you know, the, the, the biggest, most successful technology companies of their day. And they were mostly engineering and sales led. Now, I think we're seeing a huge and fundamental shift in the winning strategy. And that winning strategy is really around the ability to master that complexity and turn it into simplicity. Because, you know, it, with, with, the price world, the way it is in 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 tech, um, competition is huge. Software has never been less expensive to build. Uh, price per unit goes down very very fast, and the companies who are going to be the haves going forward 
they have to have extraordinarily high volumes, which means they've got to remove friction along the way. Um, they've got to have, you know, an easy ability for customers to, to try their technology. They have to focus on the expand. There might may not be a renewal, right, where it's just the customers, they, they try, they buy, they use, and if they don't like it, they stop, right? And the experience from pre-sales all the way through the lifetime of the solution might be a completely digital customer experience. And again, I know it's easy to say, oh, we're never going to get there. Um, but, you know, the reality is, and if you go back one second there, Thomas, the, the reality is we're on a path where product management, data, analytics are going to be driving the business. And all of those things you see in the middle, right, these journeys that we have to go on, which affect product management, the sales models, the channels, um, you know, every single element of the business, we are moving from a world that rewards complexity to a world that rewards simplicity. And if you go to the next chart, unfortunately, it's not a level playing field, right? Uh, the, the, the truth is that the newer companies who are born in the cloud, they're adopting this mentality from day one, right? They, they are really focused on a lot of the principles we're talking about here, and it's going to be easier for them. It's going to be harder, you know, for the legacy companies who were built in this era of complexity to, to think through how to defeat that complexity and to transform themselves into much simpler businesses. Uh, and again, I don't mean simple, meaning elementary. I mean that they have mastered their own complexity. Um, the B2C companies are already there, right? But I will tell you, and I've been told this over and over and over again, that enterprise customers are done with complexity. They want it out of their lives. And th they'll be patient, but their patient will have an end, and they will swap. If we don't land up embracing even in the most complex environments, we don't land up embracing this model, we will lose customers. This fourth bullet, I think, is one of the most important concepts um, that, you know, that, that, that we're, we're really thinking through at TSIA and putting on the table right now, is that I believe, we believe, that the experience of, of getting the value of your solutions and the experience of doing business with you are going to become one. Your product features and your ability to sell, price, renew, market, um, drive adoption, all of those things, those experiences are not going to be separate experiences. They're going to become one experience. That is a huge thought when you think about how we do business now. And there is going to be a lot of people who are going to say this can't be done. I, I think it, you've got to search out those negative voices um, and say, hey, this this is the future and we've got to get there. And I think, you know, again, it's not a matter of, you know, if, but when. So I, I really believe that we are in the in the middle of a huge business shift in enterprise technology and the haves are either already on that journey or they are racing to get there. Uh, and this is going to be something we're going to try to unpack here over the course of the next year or two. What are those best practices and how do you actually do it?